Hi. So to start off, I'm going to present some background, which actually is what motivated this. So IBM has a language called JRules, and this is a production rule language. Other uh, similar languages is there's an open source of JRules, and um, there's the more academic OPS5, which was one of the early papers on this. And the idea of JRules is that there's a working memory, um, which has different elements in it. These are like facts. And you essentially write patterns. You write rules that search over the working memory elements and try to find elements that match the patterns that you specify, and then you do certain actions. So in this example that I have here, we have an example where the working memory has some elements that are mark, uh, clients, and some are marketers, and marketers have a list of clients that they care about. And this particular query is con constructing the reverse mapping. So it matches for every client that we're going to name C, and the semantics of language are that that will be matched against every single working memory element which matches in turn. So this rule will fire multiple times. And then we actually have an aggregate expression here that we're going to do an aggregate search over all the working memory elements and find all marketers whose client conta uh, list contains the client that we care about. And then we'll use that information to construct the reverse mapping of clients to the marketers that care about them. So this is an existing product. There's something called the Ready Engine, which um, is a published algorithm that is used to implement this. And the problem is that it only runs on a single machine, and we don't necessarily know how to scale this and run in a distributed setting. Is the client's rule a list of fields or a list of clients? Um, so the client's uh, field here is, in this case, it's a list. So it's a list of clients. Thank you. And uh, no, it's a list of IDs. I'm sorry. Yes, in this example, it's a list of, I guess, integers or strings or whatever you're using for IDs. I think, yes, I use integers for the type uh, in this example. D despite the way it sounds, actually, this com example does compile with the stuff I'm showing you later. I just didn't remember the details of whether there's an int or a string here. Um, yeah, and so the, the approach we took is we wanted to compile this to something database-y, like relational algebra, because we know how to distribute that. There are known techniques for um, running it on large systems. There are distributed systems doing incremental updates to it and um, similar types of things that we wanted to do. So our approach was um, to try to compile JRules into relation algebra, or in this case, because we have aggregates, and so we have collections, the nested relation algebra. Now, the problem we ran into when we wanted to do this was we discovered that there was no actual semantics for JRules. There's a grammar, and there's an implementation, but no semantics. So our next problem was coming up with a semantics that we could use to ensure that our compilation was actually correct. <coughs> So we created this um, core calculus that we believe encapsulates the ideas in JRules. And the idea here, um, so the basic constructs you have are you have data. Uh, the data model here includes things like integers and strings. It also includes bags as well as records. Uh, there's unary and binary operators, which include um, th things in addition to things on primitives. It includes things like flatten of a list and record uh, proje field projection out of a record. Uh, additionally, we have map, which allows you to operate over collections, and assertions. These are used for pattern matching. So implicitly, there is um, always data that you're matching against, and you see that later on when you see the it construct, which gets that piece of data that you're actually going to match on. And then you can use assert to say, okay, so is it equal to three, or is it greater than five? Um, However, these pattern match assertions are not meant to produce fatal errors, because after all, you might say, okay, is it five? If not, then let me try matching a different pattern. So therefore, we also allow you to recover from pattern match failures using the or else construct. Um, the other thing that we have here, in addition to the implicit data, is an environment. This environment is used to bind variables that you've found already, that you've matched. Because when you're doing pattern matching, you generally want to say, okay, well, this is going to be bound to X. Now, interestingly, often you'll say, okay, and this other piece of the data is also going to be bound to X. And what you mean by that really is that it's the same X, that if you use X multiple times, it better have the same value. So that's actually included here. When, when you add to the environment, we ensure that if the field is already in the environment, the update to it, the, the, sorry, the second time you bind it has to have the same uh, value. Uh, and we also allow you to get the environment, which is then reified as a record in the actual um, runtime. So here we have an example of 
a fragment of the JRails I showed you before and how it would be encoded in our language. So here we're going to find the marker. So I'm assuming we've already bound C in the environment. And we're going to go ahead and say, OK, so the type has to be marketer. In this case, because our language doesn't directly have objects, we're encoding objects as a record with two fields. One is a type field, which gives you the name. And the other is the data field that has the actual, is a record with the fields of the class. So here we say, OK, the type has to be a marketer. And if you look up C in the environment and get its data, and then you project out the ID field, then that should be in, and that's an operator we have, in the bag of clients uh, of the item that we're currently matching against. And by the way, if that's so, then we're going to add to the environment a new binding saying, ah, so m is bound to the value of the data that we're looking at, it. So that encodes that small fragment. Then, of course, there's the rest of it. And there's all those uh, keywords like when and then. So it winds up that we can encode all of that in our language. However, rather than do it at one time in an ad hoc, each time in an ad hoc way, we built a small scaffolding, this infrastructure on top, our rules language, which just has those constructs. It has when, global, not, and return. And these can all be compiled into basic uses of our calculus. So these are all compiled away. And our semantics are just given by translation into the core language. <laughs> OK, so to summarize what I've shown so far, we have this JRules um, language that already exists. And we introduced our language that we want to use to model it. And that comes along with a bunch of operators. And this rule language on top that makes it easier to go between them. So of course, what we want to do now is compile JRules, or at least some reasonable subset of JRules, um, trying to get the whole languages a very challenging problem because it's a very large uh, language. But pretty much the examples that we, that we found, we were able to compile into <coughs> um, our rule language and then interpret with our compiler. So you know, of course, how do we know we got that right? Um, because we don't have a semantics for the first language, we can't really prove anything. But we can write unit tests. So we have a bunch of unit tests, uh, including the, basically the example I showed. And we can compile them using the, we can run them using the existing actual engine um, that runs for JRules, as well as compile them into our language and use our interpreter. And then we can verify that those give the same answer. So as I said before, we want to compile this into something uh, database-y. So instead of the relation algebra that's more common, we use the nested relational algebra, which is also well studied in the database community. Um, the major difference is that it supports nested relations. In particular, it has support for bags <coughs> and operations on them, including map and including uh, a dependent join operation. So we stick an array in our picture. And then what we want to do is, um, right, and, and the goal, of course, remember, is that given an array, we can then give that out to some distributed object store, or we can use technology to um, compile it into MapReduce jobs or some other system for running this on large data. Right, so now, of course, we want to build a compiler from our language to the nest relation algebra that we're going to denote this way, where P is patterns in our original language. So of course, what's the sort of key differences between the languages and what happens in compilation? So the first thing to note is that CAMP is very oriented around pattern matching. Whereas an array is a much more operational feel. In particular, we find, um, right, so we have to compile away these as a pattern matching into the, the more operational NRA. And in particular, things that come up are in, um, <coughs> sorry, in CAMP, we have the scrutiny, that implicit it, and we also have an environment. Now, NRA doesn't have these. NRA just has a single input that you operate over. So the compilation needs to essentially bundle up the, both of those into a single input. And then it ensures that every time that you're using original, essentially in, um, sorry, it in the original language, we compile that to in.d and in.e. And so that's part of the compilation. There's more going on because, as I said, we have to compile various constructs into NRA. I'm just trying to give you sort of a structural idea of what happens between the two languages. Um, similarly, on output, we have an issue that 
the camp has a notion of recoverable failure. You can recover from pattern match failures. And the NRA does not. NRA is just uh, plain language. So here the question mark is a lift the domain where you have either, the return is either a, a data or it's an error, a recoverable error. So we compile that away by converting data into a singleton bag containing the data and an error into the empty bag. And then all of our compilation has to take into this into account and um, ensures that the result is as you expect. And in fact, we have a proof that this is, compiler is semantics preserving um, in both directions, essentially. So we compile correct programs or correct programs, and we don't make up correct programs out of thin air. So we'll only produce programs that execute um, to a value if the original did as well. Um, one thing to take a stop here and note is that that gray box, it means something specific, the, sorry, the gray arrow. In this case, everything that you'll see in gray like that has been mechanized in COC, an interactive theorem proving assistant. Um, this is available as an accompanying artifact for the paper. Okay, so in some sense, we're done, right? I mean, we built a core language that has formal semantics and models the domain we started with. We showed that that is a reasonable choice because we can compile the source language into ours and have some tests that show that it's correct. And then we compiled to where we were going, to NRA, and we showed that it was correct. So in some sense, we could stop, but as researchers, we're curious. Okay, now we introduce a new language, Let's, we wanna understand it. What did, what did we just create? And so we wanted to understand first, one, one simple question is how expressive is it? So we know that we can compile CAMP to NRA. Can we go the other way around? Can we compile NRA back into CAMP? So the answer is yes, but to get there, we're gonna take a detour through a third language. Why not? Languages are fun. <laughs> so this is also an existing language in the database community, the name nest relational calculus. Um, and it's essentially a more declarative version of the relational algebra. They're known to be equivalent. Um, here, the key construct you'll see is the comp comprehension where you say, okay, for all elements in a bag E2, we're gonna create, we're gonna transform them and create um, a new bag. That's the key thing, and so it has a much more declarative feel as opposed to the operational NRA where you're explicitly doing maps and joins and things like that. Um, okay, so we'll throw this language on the slide. And of course, we wanna build a compiler from NRA to NNRC. Um, here you'll notice that this compiler is parameterized by X. To understand what X is, we look at what we need to do in this compilation process. So we're going from a more operational language to a more denotational one. So that, of course, involves all of our maps and joins and dependent join and Cartesian product and all that stuff has to be compiled into uses of the bag comprehension. And again, structurally, we'll notice that the input <coughs> to NRA is input that you're operating on. And NRC doesn't have any input, but it does have an environment. And so we have to essentially smuggle the input into the environment, and that's what that x was. So the x was the choice of variable we're gonna to use to represent where the input is going, and we just put it in the environment as part of the compilation. Okay, so we have that compiler, and then of course we wanna prove that it's semantics preserving, so we do that as well. So now we can complete the cycle. So now the next thing we wanna do, of course, is go from the name nest relational calculus back to camp. Um, one thing I should mention is one of the reasons for the detour through NNRC, there are a couple, one of which we'll see later when we get to types. But another reason is it winds up, it's actually a fairly good scaffolding, a fairly good intermediate place for the compiler because a lot of the work the compiler does is nicely split into taking all these different constructs and mapping them into the single bag comprehension and then all we have to do essentially is figure out how to model that bag comprehension in the um, in camp. So indeed we do this. And here again we take this uh, denotational and try to get it back into our sort of more pattern matching environment. In this case, we don't actually have to use all the features of camp. And in particular we see the input environment um, given an, an X, we just convert over into env.x and put it in the target environment. Now there is one, and we just don't use the input. So in fact, the result of our compiler completely ignores its input. There is an important subtlety here, which is that environments are actually not the same between the two languages. So I mentioned before that in camp, because it's oriented around pattern matching, if you put, try to put the same variable into the environment twice, 
it does a, a unification check. It checks to make sure that the values corresponding to the variable are the same both times. Now, NNRC is a traditional calculus. It just shadows it. So you add x twice to the environment. It will just shadow the first use of x inside of your nested comprehension. And everything would work as you'd expect in a normal lambda calculus or similar type of language. Um, so this is relatively simple to avoid in a compiler. You just have to be very careful about renaming everything so that there are no shadows in your output of your compiler. And then this difference in semantics doesn't cause problems. Um, and, and this happens elsewhere in the compilation, too. One of the tricky things about writing the compiler winds up being freshness and making sure that you never have shadowing. That causes problems. Okay, so again, we have another nice uh, correctness proof here saying that um, the languages are equivalent. By the way, I should stop and mention, if anyone has questions, please interrupt. Just Maybe I'm doing such a great job presenting no one has questions, but if you do, ask. So we now have a complete cycle, right? So we've now compiled uh, CAMP to NRA to NNRC and back to CAMP and showed um, that, all, three, that our, all our compilers are semantics preserving. As a side point, in addition to showing what we wanted about our language and showing that they're equally expressive, this has a nice, interesting side benefit of showing the NRA and NNRC equally expressive, which is well known in the database community. And NRA to NNRC is very, fairly simple. It winds up the other way around. It's very easy to find claims, and there are some papers showing the correspondence to some level of detail. But it's surprisingly difficult to find worked out proofs. And in particular, this is clearly the first mechanization that we know of that shows this correspondence. So that's an interesting little side nugget that we get out of this. Um, okay, and, and as a related point, I should mention that all these compilers um, provably uh, produce code that's a constant time size larger than their input. So we don't have anything like nasty exponential blow up or anything bad like that happening. Uh, this was also mechanized. <coughs> okay, so again, right, this is again a nice stopping point. We've introduced a language that did what we wanted. We showed that it's expressiveness. We showed you can compile it to NRA, to NNRC, back to itself. But, okay, we, we still have another question. What about types? You know, can we design a type system for this language? This is useful for a few reasons. One, because I like types, and types are good. Um, but there's another reason as well, which is particularly in NRA, um, there are a lot of optimizations that we'd like to perform, which are essentially type-based. They're presented in various ways in the database literature. Most of the ways have to do with essentially constraints on the data. But when you look at them, most of them are really types uh, on the shape of the data. And so if we have a type system, we can hope that we can then use some of these properties to help us optimize the NRA. So indeed, we introduced a, a relatively straightforward type system for a camp where we have a uh, gamma type context that types the environment, and we have an input and output type. Okay, and similarly, of course, for the operators, we have types for those. So, given that types, uh, we now, of course, want to type soundness proof. We want to say that we act, this is a reasonable type system and not just something random we made up. And so we have that, and this says the normal type soundness result, that if um, your input and your program is well typed and your environment is well typed, then it will, always, it will never get stuck. Now, note in camp, you can still result in a recoverable error because that's part of the system. This just says you won't get stuck, which essentially means you won't have a fatal error. But recoverable errors, I mean, of course those are allowed. The result of your query might be, I don't know, that nothing matched. Okay, and similarly for the operators, of course, we have type soundness proofs. So that's for camp. Now for NRA, we can also have a type system similar to existing ones. And um, similarly for NNRC, and then we can show type soundness results for all of these. So we now have type systems for all three. NRA and NRC are not novel. So now, of course, the question is, okay, we already have one circle. Could we create another one? Can we create links amongst these type systems? And we can. So we have a type preservation proof from CAMP to NRA. Now, something interesting to note here is this is a bidirectional type preservation proof. So let me elaborate a little. Actually, let me show you, just mention quickly. So, of course, we have type preservation other ones, too, from NRA to NRC and NRC back to CAMP. <coughs> So let me mention here what's so interesting about the fact this is bidirectional. So the forward direction is the standard one. It says if the source language is well typed and you compile it, then the target language, the, the output code is going to be well typed in the target language. The backward direction says something interesting. It says 
if the target language is, if the target output, sorry, if the output is well typed in the target language, then it's well typed in the original. Now, this is no longer really a statement about type checking. It's really a statement about type inference. What it means is that if you can do type inference or anything you know about type inference in the target language, also, you can pull it back into the source language. And since we have compilers in all directions throughout the whole cycle, that means type inference for any language translates into type inference for any other language. Conveniently enough, there is prior work on type inference for the name nest relational calculus. This is why I mentioned before there was another reason why taking a detour through that language was a useful idea. <coughs> so the previous work shows, first of all, it gives a polymorphic type inference algorithm for CAMP, and so we can directly use that in NNRC, sorry, for NNRC, and we can use that for CAMP for our language simply by compiling around the loop. So given any CAMP program, we can compile to NRA, compile to NNRC, and our compilers are total, so they will always produce some output in NNRC. Then we can run this type inference algorithm, and if the type inference succeeds, we can just pull back by theorem and say, aha, it has the associated type in CAMP, because the type preservation theorem didn't just say, oh, it is well-typed. It tells you what that type is, given the type in the target language. Now, the other thing this does is it gives me my first published MP completeness result for free. Because they proved MP completeness for type inference, polymorphic type inference for NNRC. And if you think about it, our compiler from um, <coughs> NNRC into CAMP is the way you do a classic MP completeness result. We start it, you start with an MP complete problem, like normally it's SAT or 3SAT or something. In this case, it's type inference, polymorphic type inference, NRC. You compile it into, you have a total compiler that can compile anything in your source problem into your target problem, and then you can declare your target problem is also MP complete. And that's what we did. What was sort of cool for me was that normally you start with the two problems and you know you want to prove MP completeness, and you create a completely artificial compiler that is just there for the sake of the proof. In this case, we started the compiler, and then we wound up with an MP completeness result, essentially for free. So that's what we did. Um, as I said, this was actually motivated by a real problem that we had in uh, a product team actually came to us and said they wanted to use JRules over the data they had, but their data was in a distributed system in memory, and they didn't know how to run JRules in a global distributed way. And in order to solve this, we built a model which formally sort of encodes some of the key semantics and the key ways that JRules program operate, and then showed how expressive it is and showed cool stuff about it. So, that's it. Okay, so there is time for questions. I think it's clear that the if you go around the whole cycle, you don't have an identity transformation. But um, is it possible that if you go, that it is idempotent? So if you go around twice, you end up the same thing if you go around once. So you're, you're certainly correct about the first statement. Um, it is not that entity. It is not as presented idempotent. It's possible that if we, we could build an optimizer or simplifier that would make it. Okay, that's not quite true. The way it's presented right now, it's not, it would never be idempotent. And the reason is the types actually change. However, that is a solvable problem. So let me explain that in a little more detail. When you go from CAMP to NRA, we had this problem I mentioned that CAMP has a notion of recoverable error and NRA does not. So as a result, we lift essentially our return type in CAMP into a bag. So it's either this, it will always be, we have an invariant as the output of the compiler, or it will always be a singleton bag or an element of data. Now, in a traditional database setting, we actually wouldn't have had to do this because they only worry about bags. They're only really worried about records, and so everything is wrapped in a bag, in which case you can just flatten into your top-level bag. As a PL people, we wanted to allow more arbitrary data that you could also have an integer as your return value. Why does it have to be in a bag? So as a result, we have to change the type. Now, if you're going around the loop multiple times, you could just add a flatten in, because after the first time from camp to NRA, you have a bag. That bag is going to be preserved when you go to NRC and back to camp. And the next time you compile, you can just flatten the result and get rid of that extra level. So if you were willing to add that in, which you can do, I mean, and it works out correctly. Um, so if you did that, 
and maybe you had a simplifier, you could probably do it. We haven't tried. Um, I was wondering whether there is a relation between your rules language, um, your patterns language, and Barry J's uh, pattern calculus, whether uh, um, one is, uh, can be encoded in the other, if you are aware of that. Uh, he has proposed a language where uh, the pattern is the fundamental concept. I th yeah. I'd have to read the language again to have a better answer for you. Um, I believe at some point I read it, but it was not recently. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested, I, I, I can try to give you a better answer uh, offline. That was really nice. Thank you. Thanks. Um, following up on John Boylan's question, very often, if it is idempotent, you find that there's a kernel of one language that's isomorphic to a kernel of the other language, and the kernels are themselves interesting. So I was just going to encourage you to follow up on uh, John's suggestion, because sometimes the isomorphisms between the kernels reveal something. And I think off the top of my head I can answer Sophia's question, because I think Barry J's pattern calculus lets you encode lambda calculus. Mm -hmm. And lambda calculus is strictly more powerful than NRA. So there might be an encoding one way, but not the other way. Okay. So if we don't have any other questions, let's thank again Avid. <laughs>